Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I don't know when you're listening or watching this presentation, but welcome. Welcome to Principles of Money Management for Fall 2022. My name is Frank Piano, and I am the instructor for this class. I introduce myself elsewhere. Take a look if you are so inclined. We use Google Docs for our presentations, and you are noticing, if you're watching, that it has built-in closed captioning. It's not perfect, but it's pretty darn good for being totally automated. If you need Americans with Disability Act compliant closed captioning, contact me immediately, because we have that capability it's just that we ration it for those classes that actually need it. So contact me immediately. Contact the DSS department. You know the drill. So let's get started. All of us at Southwestern Community College are proud, honored, happy, and grateful that you're with us. We are going to do our best to make this the best class you have ever taken. I, I know that sounds a little over the top, but it is sincere. Wait till we get the goal setting. So slide number two. We start with a perspective. It is a gloomy moment in history. Never has the future seemed so dark and incalculable. The United States is beset with racial, industrial, and commercial chaos drifting we know not where of our troubles. No one can see the end. So uh, where did you see this? Where did you hear this? Uh, on uh, Skunk News uh, last night? On, on Weasel News? Badger News? Fox, Fox News! Yeah, Fox News. The end of the world is on nigh. We have the communists and Democrats in charge of, of everything, and they're going to destroy the country and the, the BLM and the... Yeah, you, you, you folks, if you ask people when this was written, if you ask people this, when this was said, many will say um, the Great Depression, World War II, maybe 9-11. It was actually said in 1847. <laughs> um, did they have serious issues in the 1840s? Uh, yes. Uh, the nation, the United States, was about ready to tear itself apart because of the peculiar institution. Isn't that, a, isn't that a great thing, way to call it? Don't call it slavery. Call it the peculiar institution. And we're still dealing with racial, industrial, and commercial chaos. But the last 200 years, the last 20 years, have been the most prosperous years in the history of the world. More people as a percentage of the world's population are coming, have come out of poverty and have entered the world global middle class. Now, you can't compare the global middle class with the United States middle class. The rest of the world is catching up, and that's a good thing, especially for, for we investors, for us investors. But even though they had serious problems in the 1840s, and we have serious problems in the 2020s, so far, so far, equating serious with fatal has been wrong. In fact, if you were positive, if you were optimistic and invested accordingly, you've done pretty darn well. Because our standard of living is unimaginable to the people back 200 years ago. They, they couldn't believe it. Folks, they didn't even have toilets. <laughs> they, they didn't have uh, plumbing. Yet, you had to walk the privy in the rain or in the snow. <laughs> so we are going to emphasize the positive. Even though we have tremendous issues that we have to deal with, we have to deal with global warming. We will. I know we will. Why? Because we don't have a choice. We have to deal with our racial issues. I don't know how we're going to do that one. We have to deal with the commercial chaos meted upon us by that stupid, stupid microbe, but we will. I am very positive. And people ask me why. I say, well, look, look at what happened with COVID. 
It used to take four, six, ten years to come up with a vaccine for a virus. Multiple organizations around the world, not just the United States, but multiple organizations around the world came up with effective, some not so effective, but mostly effective vi virus uh, vaccines in less than six months. Now, it took about a year or so for them to, to be you know, mass produced and gotten out to the public. And at the same time, we had a sizable portion of the population thinking it was all a hoax and that the viruses were going to track us with put chips in our bodies. So we've got serious issues, but I am going to always accentuate the positive because it turns out, folks, it turns out that the optimists have are wealthier, they're better off financially, and they're healthier and they live longer. And the pessimists say, well, they're just not being, <laughs> the optimists are just not being realistic. But I love this one saying, be ye joyful, even after you've considered all the facts. So that's our uh, viewpoint. We're going to look positively towards the future. So let's continue and start with chapter one, personal financial planning. And we start with an old Russian proverb. It is not money that brings happiness. It's lots of money. Now, <laughs> is this true? It turns out, you know, not necessarily. I mean, you don't want to be abject poverty. You don't want to have abject poverty. You want to have enough money to, uh, there's a uh, Mavslov's needs assessment hierarchy where you want to have enough money to, to live and, and to be feel safe and have clean water and food and the like. But once you get over a certain amount, Mm, the uh, the incremental benefits of extra money don't necessarily uh, uh, benefit, don't necessarily translate into, into happiness. But I just love this saying. It's not money that brings happiness. It's lots of money. And we're going to teach you, especially if when you're younger, we're going to teach you how you, assuming the world doesn't end, and we, we, <laughs> we slog on and fix the things that we need to fix, um, and build substantial wealth. We'll see that in our second presentation, so stick with us. Now, here's a definition that we'll use in our class. It's okay, you know, I'm not that fond of it, but it, it works. Personal financial planning is the process of managing your money to achieve personal economic satisfaction. Now, isn't that an a unusual choice of words? Satisfaction. In other words, did you get value? Did you get joy? Did you get satisfaction from the process of managing your money? Yeah. Some other definitions. The ability to use knowledge and skills to manage one's financial resources effectively for lifetime financial security. Or the process of realizing more enjoyment, enjoyment as opposed to satisfaction, from income and improving one's standard of living while making adequate arrangements for a secure and comfortable retirement. So this one's a little bit more, um, a little bit more looking towards the future. And then this last one is from the life insurance industry. The process of identifying assets, determining the classification of those assets in regard to both current and future needs. Something we'll discuss in chapter two, what's going on in the in today and what, what do we need to worry about in the future. Analyzing our debt, expenses, and consumption patterns reviewing our tax status, and addressing a host of other issues and concerns. And that last one is basically what this class is all about, folks, as we'll see. How would you define personal financial planning? Hmm? You come up with your own definition. But the one that we're going to use on the exam, notice when you see, when you see something that's highlighted, either bold or, or italics or both, it's probably going to be on the fine, on the exam, so just put that down in your study guide. So how would you define personal financial planning? You come up with your definition, but use this one for the exam, all right? The process of managing your money to achieve personal economic satisfaction. Yes. Now, what are the benefits? Slide number five. There are several benefits, folks. Increased effectiveness in obtaining, using, and protecting your financial resources. Increased control of your financial affairs. 
a sense of freedom from financial worries obtained by being able to look optimistically towards the future. There's that word again, optimistically. We want you to be able to face the future with a positive attitude. And the tools that we're going to learn in this, in this class will help you in the financial realm, in the financial world. Uh, there's other issues that you have to deal with, <laughs> relationships and health and other like, and the like. But we're gonna, we can only do so much, right? We're gonna uh, help you with the uh, financial part. And the one that I think is the most important is the last one: improved personal relationships. The number one reason for divorce is financial incompatibility. Uh, you ask people why they got the, oh, well, you know, what a mess that they left me with uh, financially. So we want you to be successful financially. We also want you to be successful in your relationships and taking away that financial hardship, that financial insecurity, and being able to look optimistically towards the future. It's not a guarantee, but it should help you in your personal relationships. Now, when we take a look at developing a financial plan, we take a more flexible uh, approach in this class. A financial plan is a formalized report that summarizes your current financial situation, analyzes your needs, and then recommends future financial activities. So we're gonna do this. In some classes, they make a big deal out of it. They want you to, to create all these documents and put it in a three ring binder or a binder and then put it on your shelf and never look at it again. No, folks, we're gonna create a few documents that you wanna have at your disposal all the time, tacked up on your refrigerator or bedroom mirror or whatever. But then the others will create as we need them, as we need them. So you'll see that I'm a little bit more flexible with regard to how we create the financial plan. That is this class. It can be created by you, done with the assistance from a financial planner for a ton of money. And again, you wind up with this beautiful three ring binder or bound object that you put on your shelf and never look at it again. Or using these money management software packages, which I don't, I'm not too keen on those either, uh, but um, they work. I like spreadsheets. We're going to use spreadsheets, uh, either manually done or electronically done. And uh, they, they seem to work best for me. Everyone's different. That's why there's chocolate and vanilla. So stick with us and learn the way we do it. And then you decide whether you want to go to a financial planner or we'll use one of these financial programs. Oh, they're free, a lot of them. Why? Because they're getting all your data and using it to sell stuff to you. Hmm, nothing's free. All right, so now, here is an example of one financial planning process. Very, very formal. Determine your financial, current financial situation. Develop your financial goals. Identify alternative courses of action and evaluate your alternatives. Keeping in mind opportunity costs and risks. Huh? We'll discuss what opportunity costs are. Create and implement a financial action plan and write it down. And then our last... Step is to reevaluate and revise your plan. Hmm. Does anybody really do all this stuff, folks? <laughs> uh, you know, there are some people who do this, who 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 make this formal process, and 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 you know what? They're they're not much fun at parties. Everybody else is skinny dipping out in the pool, and they're up in their room reevaluating and revising their financial planning. Yeah, this is a more realistic and typical financial planning process here on slide number eight. Number one, make money. Number two, spend it. Number three, go make some more money. And number four, spend that and then spend a little more. Wait a minute. How do you spend money you don't have? Number five, go into debt. Oh no, number six, panic. Number seven, take business 121 principles of money management. <laughs> yeah, lots of anybody's have done this, folks. So we're going to be more relaxed with regard to our financial plan with 
the exception of a few documents, which I'm going to hammer away at you, jump up and down, scream and holler and beg and plead for you to have at your disposal every day. You see, on slide number nine, it all comes down to the choices we make. We have to think in terms of opportunity cost. Now, that's a, it's a it's kind of a strange concept, uh, but that's the term that the economists came up with. A, a better term or an easier term is the trade-off. You might want to think of it as a trade-off. By making a decision, we are essentially pushing away all the other possibilities that we could use, that we could have, have chosen. And that's called opportunity cost. It's what you give up by making a choice. The opportunity cost is sometimes referred to as the trade-off of a decision. And I think the trade-off is sometimes a little bit easier to understand, but you decide. You can't always measure it in dollars. Sometimes the cost is your time or health. And what we want you to do is think about what we're giving up by making this decision right now. By going on that Tahiti vacation, that we're throwing on our credit card, what are we giving up? What are we going to have to pay to uh, to to do to do what we want to do? What are we gonna? What could have we have done with that money? And so, um, the economists like to say they like to say there's no such thing as a free lunch. It's essentially, whatever you do, it's going to cost you. And we asked the question in the face to face class. Um, what are the opportunity costs of attending college? What could you be doing right now instead of sitting listening to some instructor burble away about financial planning? You could be out making money. <laughs> you could be working. You could be at the beach enjoying yourself, right? So you believe at this moment in time that the opportunity costs of, of, uh, of uh, going to college and taking this class are not as important as it is for you to spend the time and uh, and take the class. So that that's the idea. And and it's not, you know sometimes it's not that important. You admit, you make a decision about going out to lunch or something like that. But if you do that every day, yes. So think about what you're giving up by making the choices that you're making. And we'll discuss more about this as we get to goal setting and the like. Because every decision involves making choices about uh, personal financial, uh, personal opportunity costs versus the financial acquisitions, uh, the financial opportunity costs versus the investments or the insurance that we, we buy or the, the, uh, the uh, investment alternatives. There's a wonderful book that was written many years ago, but it's been rediscovered re by the new generations called Your Money or Your Life. Now be careful, there's a couple other books with the same name. But it was originally written by Vicki Robin and Joe Dominguez, but Mr. Dominguez is no longer with us. And Vicki Robin, she's elderly now, but she's been um, elevated <laughs> by the younger folks because of her ideas. Uh, she says, look, do you really need to have that new car? Do you, do you really need to take that, that, that very expensive vacation? And so we have to think in terms of what are we giving up for the things that we believe or told we have to have. And that's why it's called your money or your life. Because you're, give, you're giving up that most precious asset, the time you have on this dirt, for the things that you believe you must have or told that you must have by the folks on the television or your influencers on sick talk, I'm sorry, uh, big box, uh, tick, 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 yeah. Okay, every slide number 11, every financial decision involve, involves evaluating types of risks. And there are many risks, folks, inflation risks, uh, rising of co prices, cause loss buying power, interest rate risks. We'll discuss what happens when interest rates go up and when interest rates go down. Income risk, the loss of a job, safety, health risk, personal risks, liquidity risk. What is that? is that not having enough beer for the weekend? No, no, that's that's um that has to do with investments. Some investments are highly liquid, which means 
you can sell them easily and others are not so easily sold. So uh, if we want to uh, uh, be able to get our money quickly, we want to look for what are called liquid investments as opposed to illiquid investments. And then this one I just kind of made up on myself. The culture of consumerism risk. Die working and in, up, in debt up to your eyeballs risk. Because there are some people who say, oh yeah, you should die with the most amount of debt you, you have because how are they going to collect? You're dead. I don't know that I agree with that. In fact, I don't agree with it. Can you guard against all risks? Well, it turns out you can. There's an entire industry called the insurance industry whose main job, <laughs> whose the job, whose sole job is to guard against certain risks. The problem is if you did, you'd wind up giving all your money to the insurance companies. But there are some risks that are very important. And we will discuss those in chapters 8, 9, and 10. Yeah, right, 8, 9, and 10. So implementing your financial plan means developing good financial habits. Use a well-conceived spending plan to help you stay within your income while allowing you to save and invest for the future. So this is what we're going to discuss in chapters 1 and 2. Have appropriate insurance protection. As I said, we'll discuss those later on. And then we'll discuss taxes. Ooh, everybody's favorite subject to hate. And investment alternatives. My favorite part of the semester. Achieving your financial objectives requires a willingness to learn and the appropriate information sources. And there's an entire army out there. Slide number 13 of folks who want to help you with books and magazines and financial institutions. This course is a great start. Seminars, software programs, online information sources. The infernal net is an ex inexhaustible supply. Be careful. Sometimes useful, sometimes not. And as we said, as we, if you remember, we mentioned that some of these places that always oh, our services are free. Why are they free? Because they want to know everything they can about you. And then professionals. And I got to tell you, folks. The industry needs you. The industry is looking at a situation where tens of thousands of us old oh, folks are about ready to retire or die, and they need new professionals. And they know this. We have an investment club. If you go to our investment club website, you'll see advertisements, websites uh, for, uh, for jobs, for, for, for insurance companies and brokerage firms and, and banks and, and real estate finance companies. And they all have women and minorities and veterans and bilingual. They know they need diversity because those of you who are familiar with San Diego, unless you're listening to this, watching this from somewhere else, if you have a brokerage firm or an insurance company in the South Bay area where Southwestern is, is located and you don't have somebody who speaks Spanish, you're losing business. If you're out in East County and you don't have somebody who speaks Arabic, you're losing business. So the industry knows they need um, um, more diversity, which is a phenomenal opportunity for our students because the, the, the greatest plurality at Southwestern is Latino, right? And we also have a lot of Filipino, and uh, now we're getting more and more folks from, from the East County in the area um, speaking Arabic and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Afghani. So, hey, <laughs> It's a tremendous opportunity, and contact me. We'll discuss it on and off. But check out the uh, investment club. I'll send you. I'll send you an email. Don't worry. Check out the investment club where we have folks from the profession, folks from the industry, come and discuss their professions, their uh, what the skills are necessary to get into the industry, and how they uh, got their start. Cool. What are some of the influences on personal financial planning? Well. Marital status, right? The most important financial decision you'll ever make. Household size, your employment, marriage, birth or adoption of a child, divorce. One of the worst things that can happen to you financially. Bankruptcy, yeah, the worst thing that can happen. What are the values and ideas and principles that you consider desirable, correct, and important? And, isn't this cute, the adult life cycle stage. That's a college way of saying, how old are you, right? We can't just say how old you are. We have to come up with a silly name for it. What generation do you belong to? Never before has this happened. Why? Because of medical advancements in, in, uh, 
in, a, in, our, in our society where people are living far longer, we still have 23 million as of 2020, and the number is going, shrinking quickly, of the traditionalists, the matures, sometimes called the greatest generation, the folks who were born before 1946. But by far, the ones that have had the biggest impact on our society are the baby boomers. And we're starting to get up there, folks. I'm one of them. Uh, the baby boom generation, when they came from when the EGIs came back from the war, their job, World War II, was to have as many children as they could to fight those Ruskies. If you only had one or two children in your family, there was something odd about your family, probably communist sympathizers, because it was typical to have five, six or more kids. The baby boomers sort of rejected the, um, not sort of, they did reject the traditionalist uh, loyalty to the government. Why? Because World War II was a lot different than the Vietnam War. And there were 56, 60, 57 million baby, 57,000, I'm sorry, not 57 million, 57,000 baby boomers who died in the, the uh, Vietnamese War, the Vietnam War. And uh, we never really understood why we fought it. It was a very strange situation. And what came next were the Gen Xers. Well, the baby boomers revolted with, with, with rock and roll and sex and drugs and rock and roll. And there were the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement and the gay rights movement. It was a turbulent time. And then Watergate. And the Gen Xers came along. Notice there's only 65 million of them sometimes called the baby bust, and they sort of turned the whole thing on its head. No longer was rock and roll about sinning and, and, and protesting and, 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 and being a refuse Nick. <laughs> rock and roll now is at the Super Bowl and, at, uh, and Christian rock. Oh, my goodness. We baby boomers said, Christian rock, what does it matter with you? Rock is about sinning all day and all the night. Let's spend the night to get, no, 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 no. MTV, now rock and roll is at the sports stadiums and the presidential elections. Pretty amazing. And then the millennials come along and they turn everything upside down with their digital, they're called, sometimes called the digital generation and then they also call them Gen Y. But they, you know, grew up with the computers that we are still, we baby boomers are still fumbling to try to get to work. I'm really bad with my cell phone. My fingers are so huge. And what's amazing is that they, the millennials, and now the Gen Z generation, who've grown up never even knowing, you know, never even knowing a time before social disease, I'm sorry, social networking and the like, they have at their disposal tools that we had in our science fiction movies and books and the like. And so I'm really, really optimistic because we boomers, we would never listen to our, our parents' music. Sinatra, I don't care how good a singer he is. Uh, uh, Rosemary Clooney, who cares? I'm not interested. Whereas the millennials, they don't have a problem. They listen to the Beatles or they listen to Led Zeppelin. Or I saw one little millennial with a Led Zepp, uh, no, 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 uh, uh, Leonard Skinner shirt. And I said, do you really listen to Leonard Skinner? She said, yeah, they rock. And I thought, okay. And um, yeah, so, so with, with the new generation, Gen Z, it's only, I think, only going to accelerate. I am thoroughly convinced, economically, scientifically, I'm very, very positive. We're going to cure cancer. We're going to have universal translators. We're pretty darn close. We're going to have driverless cars, maybe even driverless, driverless uh, you know, flying machines, uh, planes. Uh, politically, I'm terrified because the rise of, of, fun, of fundamentalism and the rise of authoritarianism around the world, not, not just here, is, uh, is a very scary sign. Dictatorships are not very good for personal freedoms, nor are they very good for economies. So I leave you with that. 
I'm excited about the future. We'll see exactly what happens because that's why they call it the future. If we knew what's going to happen, it wouldn't be called the future. Prediction is difficult, especially about the future. So let's continue with influences on personal financial planning on slide number 15. And I saw this t-shirt and I just broke out laughing. Um, here's good, the man and the woman, and better, of course, guys, right? You have two women. And then best, the guy with the video game. And the guys, in, when, when we have the face-to-face -face class, they go, oh, no, I know. I said, oh, yeah, think about it. Think about it. Right now, right now, if I may, you had to make a choice whether you could have snacks or your video games. But that's it. You, can't, you have to choose between one or the other for the rest of your life. Which one would you choose? Think about it. How much time do you spend playing video games versus how much time you, you spend making whoopee? It's a hard choice, isn't it, for some of you younger folks? So slide number 16. What are the economic factors? Well, these are more discussed in an economics class, but we'll discuss them in, in, in um, passing. Supply and demand. Supply and demand. What do you get when you teach a parrot how to say supply and demand? A learned economist. Production costs, competition, the influences of the financial institutions, including the Federal Reserve Bank and the global uh, uh, banks around the world, the global uh, central banks, as they're called. Ex exports, imports, and all the different economic conditions like consumer prices and inflation, consumer spending, interest rates, money supply, unemployment, housing starts, gross domestic product, a fancy word for how much we produce and consume. The trade balance or imbalance, the budget deficit, the financial markets. Look, do any of us have much of control over these? No, not really. That's why we will focus on the things that we can do and do have control over. Because as we do, as we make our financial world a better place for us to live in, we make the world at large a better place. Don't believe me? Think about it. If you were to go to a drop of water in a flood and say, are you responsible for this flood? The drop of water would look at you and say, what are you talking about? I'm a, I'm a drop of water. But in, in, in very real terms, every single drop of water in that flood is responsible for the flood. And in, in very real terms, every single one of us is responsible for the aggregate uh, prosperity that we want everyone to enjoy. Now, you know, nothing's perfect. That includes capitalism. I'll be the first person to, to, to admit it. I'm a stockbroker, for goodness sakes. You know, nothing's perfect. We, nothing's we humans have ever done. And you might even say that capitalism is the absolute worst economic system ever devised by we humans. Except for all the others. <laughs> yeah. Now, the Chinese are, you know, they're pulling it off. We'll see what happens. Uh, usually with capitalism comes democracy and representative government. And the Chinese are saying, no, 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 no. We can keep our authoritarian rule and still have a, have a prosperous economic system. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see what happens with that. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very big um, uh, experiment that the Chinese are pulling off. I don't think they're going to in the long run, be able to do it, but that doesn't mean I'm right, doesn't mean I'm wrong. I think as the younger generations wake up and say, look, you know, we want, we want personal freedoms. We'll see what happens. Okay, so you're a drop of water and you're responsible for the flood in a good way. I mean, not saying not in a bad way. Make your financial world a better place, you make the entire global financial world a better place. And so here is our chapter on a single slide here, folks. In chapters one and two, we'll discuss planning. Very important. Uh, goal setting is our next uh, presentation. Very important. And then in chapter two, we'll discuss um, the uh, financial statements that allow us to, to accomplish those goals. We spent a chapter on taxes, everybody's favorite subject to hate. Then we'll discuss uh, uh, payments, banking, savings, borrowing, debt, spending, con consumer strategies, and housing, and cars, and then managing risk, insurance, my least favorite part of the semester, but the necessary evil. Insurance is very important. And then we 
I know it's, it's towards the end of the semester, so I, I apologize, but it makes sense to put it there. Uh, sometimes I wonder, should we put investing first? No, not really. But we'll, don't worry, next chapter we'll hint at thing, better things to come when we discuss investment alternatives. And remember that there's another class that goes along with this class called Introduction to Investments. It's still open, assuming you're not in the third week, but it, there's still uh, spots for you in that class. So check it out. And of course, you can always take it for free on my website uh, if you don't need the college credit. And then our last chapter, we'll discuss the final chapters of life, retirement, and estate planning. So are you excited? I hope so. Uh, make sure you get that study guide out with you. Uh, go through the presentations. In our next presentation, we'll learn how to set, how to write effective, well-written goals that will help us succeed in this scary, joyful, beautiful, absurd, <laughs> bizarre adventure that we call life. Thank you so much for being in our class, dear students. We are so happy, proud, honored, and grateful that you are with us.